Audiobook Academy. Book Summary. Atlas Shrugged. By Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand wrote Atlas Shrugged in 1957. It is her fourth and last novel. She regarded it to be her magnum opus. Fantasy, science fiction and mystery are all featured in this novel. The book also promotes Rand's theory of objectivism. An American Dystopia, The Book of Jay is a dystopian novel set in the future. Government rules and taxes become too much for businessmen to bear at a certain point. All of them strike. Each head of businesses and industries secretly leaves their lives to gather in a distant valley in Colorado to build their own utopia. Meanwhile, they are waiting to return to their homeland and rebuild the economy with capitalism and individualism as the rest of the country crumbles around them due to their absence. Ayn Rand focused her plot around the railroad barons. She explored the necessity of transferring products from supplier to production. Removed cogs were shown to have an effect on the machine. One of her primary characters is a powerful woman in the corporate world. This was an unusual function to place a woman in at the time in literature. When it came to making life decisions, Dagny was a strong woman who didn't let her romantic life influence her. She had no qualms about prioritizing her career over her love life. What if all the creative brains went on strike? Asks author Ayn Rand in her book. John Galt was the first thinker to choose this path. To indicate their displeasure with the government's constraints on inventiveness, others followed his lead and inquired, who is John Galt? The film Atlas Shrugged begins with a street person asking a suit and tie-wearing executive in inquiry. Eddie Willers is Tagger Transcontinental's vice president's special assistant. Who is John Galt? Was the question he was asked as he walked towards his New York office. As a slang phrase signifying melancholy and ambiguity, Eddie uses the question. Eddie continues on his journey after handing over some money to the thief. However, he begins to feel a sense of dread without any apparent reason at this time of day. Eddie observes the failing business as he passes on his route to see the railroad's president, Jim Taggart, while he tries to calm his fears. Another Rio Norte line accident has occurred. Eddie insists on speedy repairs, while Jim suggests they hold off until steel from Warren Boyle's associated steel is delivered. Jim tells Eddie that Boyle, whom he considers a dear friend, is in desperate need of the business. They could lose a lot of business if they don't get the holdup resolved. They've already lost Ellis Wyatt's business to Dan Conway, the owner of the new Phoenix Durango Railroad, who figured out a method to resuscitate the oil trade. In response to Eddie bringing up Jim's sister and what she said, Jim cuts him off with, Damn my sister. Pop Harper, the chief clerk for Jim Taggart's father, runs into Eddie as he exits the office. During the process of trying to fix a typewriter, Pop begins to talk about the futility of life with Eddie. Finally, he says, who is John Galt? After spending some time on the Rio Norte line, Dagny Taggart has boarded a train back to New York. The brakeman is whistling when she hears a lovely melody. He tells her it's Richard Halley's fifth concerto when she inquires. He becomes more evasive when she tells him that Richard Halley only composed four concertos. Later, when the train stops and Dagny is awakened from her deep sleep, she decides to look into it. The engineer has come to a halt because of a red light on the track signaling danger. Dagny tells him to keep going, and then tells herself that she plans to promote someone employee she knows and trusts, Owen Kellogg. Her brother, Jim, learns from Dagny that she has decided to cancel the order with Orrin Boyle and to place an order for a new type of steel from Reardon Metal. Jim is infuriated. He doesn't trust an unproven metal since he wants to maintain the order with the smaller manufacturer. Jim finally gives in after some more back and forth. When Dagny returns to her office, she does some research on Halley's fifth concerto. She is informed that he left the music industry eight years ago. A few days after that, Owen Kellogg visits her, but he quits before she can give him the promotion. Who is John Galt? She inquires. Hank Reardon is observing the pouring of Reardon metal. Later, he walks home and reflects on the past decade of work he's put into this piece of metal. He also reflects on his time at the mine and the efforts he made to become a co-owner of the company. On his return, he finds his wife, brother Philip and an old acquaintance who has had little success in business, Paul Larkin, waiting for him. The family's criticism of him and his dedication to his career are demoralizing, even if he has apologized for being late. To his mother, the bracelet made of Reardon metal is a selfish gift, because another guy would have given his wife diamonds and made her happy. Larkin reminds him that he should focus less on his individualism and more on the lobbyist he has recruited for Washington. In the eyes of his wife, he keeps them around to be able to dominate them. Several men gather in a dark tavern to discuss business. 
Competition from Reardon Steel is making Oren Boyle unhappy. He believes he will use his power to persuade the federal government to force Reardon to surrender his mining rights. It has been reported that Paul Larkin plans to remove the mines from Reardon and hand them over to Boyle. In order to reclaim control, Taggart wants Boyle to utilize the National Alliance of Railroads to force Dan Conway out of Colorado by threatening to sue him. Wesley Mouch, Reardon's lobbyist or guy in Washington. In exchange for his assistance in the fight against Reardon, Jim pledges to locate him a job in Washington, D.C. The topic shifts to Jim's train project in Mexico, the San Sebastian Line, which he built. Mexico is threatening to nationalize his line, but Boyle urges him not to worry about it. There are no new trains on that route. In the future, Jim confronts his sister about Mexico's train system's deterioration. Her reasoning for doing so is because Mexico is shortly going to nationalize the line. It was for the benefit of the Mexican people, and for the benefit of Danconia's copper mines, he claims. When Francisco Danconia becomes a playboy, she says, that stops him from generating copper. The Taggart Cafeteria is where Eddie Willers has his lunch. Having sat down to converse with a grease-stained laborer, when it comes to rail decline and the global economy in general, he is a grouch. He has high hopes for the Dagny and the Rio Norte line, however. Dagny's personal life appears to be of interest to the stranger. The new contractor, McNamara, has resigned. When Eddie tells Dagny, he is unable to explain to her why or where the man has gone. Mexico has completed the nationalization of the railroad and copper mines. Jim takes credit for Dagny's initiative to remove equipment from Mexico before it was nationalized when he addresses the board of directors. For example, the anti dog eat dog rule established by the National Alliance of Railroads encourages smaller railroads to follow the larger railroads' choices. The fact that Dagny will no longer be fighting against Dan Conway hits home for her. He refuses to engage in combat, claiming that he is too exhausted. After that, he urges her to get the Rio Norte line operational as soon as possible. Only this will save Ellis Wyatt. Worried about his own safety, Wyatt rushes to meet her and threatens to pull her railroad down with him unless she intervenes. The transportation he needs will be provided in a timely manner by her, she says. Hank Reardon meets with Dagny. Instead of 12 months of production, she advises him to increase it to 9 months. They are drawn to one another because they are meeting each other on equal ground. He regards them both as world changers. Mexico assures Dagny that the mines have been extinguished by now. She confronts Francisco Danconia in her rage. For years, he and she were inseparable. Because he deliberately lost money for investors, including her brother, she is devastated. Her railroad, he informs her, is the target of his wrath. When she presses him for an explanation, he explains that she isn't ready to hear the truth yet and doesn't have the fortitude to face it head on. The Reardon's wedding anniversary party is attended by many of the show's most memorable characters. Reardon has no desire to attend, yet feels compelled to do so. Dagny doesn't like him since he's cranky and cold. Abolishing the railroads is a hot topic among friends of his wife's who are educated. In the presence of Francisco, Reardon tells his wife to keep the man away from him, but he continues to seek for the man himself. That's what he claims he came to the party to do. When Francisco asks Reardon why he carries so many people, the latter says that it is because they are all weak and that he doesn't mind the weight. Reardon pays attention to what Francisco has to say. There are no weak people, Francisco says. They use his remorse to attack him. In response to a statement made by a party guest that John Galt was a millionaire who found Atlantis, Francisco claims he believes it, despite Dagny's skepticism. Dagny notices Lillian's jewelry and is awestruck by its design. Lillian says she'd be happy to trade it in for a pair of diamond earrings. Lillian accepts Dagny's offer of a diamond bracelet in exchange. Standing next to his wife, Reardon tells Dagny that her service in the trade is unnecessary. Rio Norte's rebuilding is now underway, however it is beset by difficulties. But Dagny and Reardon keep things moving along. Ellis Wyatt lends a hand in the background. It's a terrific idea, and Dagny feels Reardon's steel would be perfect for the job. Dagny hears men moaning about the decline of morality in modern society while drinking a cup of coffee at a New York cafe. Who is John Galt? Is a common question. Apparently, a rogue claims to be an explorer who found the fabled source of eternal youth. The State Science Institute's Dr. Potter tries to buy the rights to Reardon's new metal so that he can shut down production, but Reardon refuses. Because of this, they issue a statement warning about the potential risks of his metal, without relying on any actual evidence. 
Because of this, Taggart's stock drops, their contractor leaves, and the Brotherhood of Road and Track Workers convinces people to stop using Reardon Metal. There is no sign of Jim Taggart. To learn more, Dagny heads to the State Science Institute in Albany, New York. In spite of Dr. Stadler's assurances that the metal is a significant discovery, the institution has refused to fund its further development since it hasn't been able to come up with a solution that is as effective. When Dagny comes across Jim, he's in a state of panic over the fate of his railroad business. Dagny proposes to leave Taggart's and form her own company to finish the task because everyone is terrified of utilizing Reardon metal. Once she's satisfied showing off the metal works, she'll head back to Taggart's and build the railroad. The John Galt line is the name she intends to give her new business. The Colorado industrialists and Reardon help Dagny locate investors for her new venture. The Equal Opportunity Act is passed by the legislature. This legislation requires Reardon to surrender his mines. Not even his guy in Washington can reach him. Paul Larkin buys Reardon's ore mines and a Pennsylvania investor buys his coal mines. So that Taggart's business can last long enough to be his long-term customer, he utilizes the money to help him out. The John Galt line debuts and is a big hit with passengers. The bridge made of Reardon's metal is also quite sturdy. When something good happens, people are happy and upbeat about the future. Dagny and Reardon become inseparable. After having intercourse with her, Reardon feels dissatisfied with both himself and her. The fact that she wants him to have sex with her whenever he wants shows how proud she is of their accomplishment. In the meantime, Jim encounters a poor, young shop girl who mistakenly believes he is Taggart the successful Taggart from the John Galt line. Once he lets her believe it, he drives back to his place and brings her in. An abandoned factory in a deserted town is discovered by Reardon and Dagny during an investigation drive. They find a motor meant to function on static electricity that has been left to deteriorate within the factory. In order to repair it, they're looking for the original inventor. The government is becoming more and more involved in the affairs of business. Businesses will be relocated to Colorado in order to control the production of Reardon metal. Jim Taggart had previously arranged for Paul Larkin to transport the ore to Orrin Boyle instead of Reardon. Using unlawful agreements, Reardon acquires the ore he was compelled to sell to Larkin from his own mines. Dagny is still on the prowl for the motor's creator. She learns that the plant was shut down due to poor management. Francisco's mines went bankrupt because of the same strategy. People are compensated according to their needs, not their earnings, and those who work the hardest help those who don't. She finally reaches a man she believes to be connected to the inventor. Hugh Axton, a renowned philosopher who is now working as a cook in a diner, appears. Cigarettes with cash signs on them are given to her by him. He knows the inventor, but he refuses to reveal her name. Dagny is in New York and learns about all the measures that harm the major firms. They are also charging Colorado at a higher rate than other states. Dagny discovers Alice Wyatt has vanished after burning his oil fields in Colorado. I'm going to leave it how I found it. Thank you. Do your thing. It's all yours now, baby. Part 2, either, or. Industrialists in Colorado have begun to disappear as the state's economy continues to decline. The supply of oil and coal decreases as their producers disappear. With each passing day, the pace of the train slows, and the amount of power they can pull drops. Because of government subsidies, Taggart's profits continue to rise. Dagny, on the other hand, is relentless in her pursuit of the motor's creator. Reardon is compelled to supply metal to anyone who asks for it under the fair share law. He's having a hard time keeping up with everything. Men with clout and government are prioritized ahead of those with more valid instructions. Who gets orders and how much is being monitored by the government, which sends a young guy as deputy director of distribution. He is referred to as the wet nurse by his guys. When a state science institute representative asks for part of Reardon's medal for Project X, he encourages him to just steal it. His understanding is that they need him to give in, but he refuses to do so. It's Dagny's belief that some sort of destroyer is stealing the best and the brightest. She enlists the services of Quentin Daniels to handle the motor reconstruction. Ken Daniger buys more from Reardon than the law permits. The shop girl becomes Jim's wife. Lillian tells Jim that her wedding gift is bringing her husband, so that it appears that her husband is terrified of him. Then Lillian informs Dagny that she wants her bracelet back since she believes that wearing it will lead to gossip. It'll look like you and Reardon are having an affair, Dagny inquires of her. Reardon insists that Lillian apologize to Dagny despite her denials. In Dagny's favor and not his wife's, he is definitely on her side. Francisco, who is also at the party, 
Here's a remark that money is the basis of all sin. Francisco is of the opposite opinion. He believes that the highest good is represented by money. He claims that the only evil is not thinking, and that is exactly what Reardon is doing with his actions. He promises to show Reardon the right path. Next morning, all of his stockholders will find out how poorly he managed the mines. His stock price will plummet. Many of the visitors lose money as a result of this, including Jim. Lillian begins to suspect that Reardon and Dagny are having an affair. Fares from the State Science Institute tells Reardon that he will report him to the police if he doesn't hand over the steel for Project X. As a result of Reardon's refusal to cave into Daniger's threats, the two are brought to justice. Daniger decides to retire as their court date approaches. While in town, Francisco stops into Reardon's mill to say hello. He wants to know why Reardon allows the looters to exploit him and disparage his achievements. He thinks Reardon should have reaped enormous rewards for his ingenious idea. Rather than benefiting the looters, however, his efforts have been a waste. Asked about Atlas, the god who is meant to be holding the universe up on his shoulders, Reardon responds that if he ever encountered him in this state what he would tell him. Having no idea what Francisco would reply, Reardon enlists the help of his friend. Shrug is all he responds with. In the meantime, an alarm goes off, and Reardon is forced to investigate the source of the noise. Francisco and Reardon labor together to fix a furnace that has been damaged. What does Francisco say when Reardon asks whether he wants to continue? Mr. Reardon, I'm not going to pry. I know it. During Thanksgiving dinner, Reardon begins to see his family from a more objective perspective. He realizes that they have treated him with contempt for many years. It is clear to them that he will no longer accept their moral code over his own. Throughout his trial, Reardon never wavers in his convictions. In a statement to the judge, he says that the trial is a joke and he is innocent. He created the medal and will not feel bad about profiting from it. Especially when he is greeted with applause from the public, the judges have no recourse. They fine him $5,000 and dismiss the charges. While staying in San Francisco, Reardon pays a visit to Francisco from his hotel room. The conversation shifts to sex, and Francisco explains that a man's sexual preferences are a reflection of his sense of self-worth. It's up to him whether he goes with a low-level woman or a high-level deity. Then he informs Reardon that he has only ever loved one woman. After taking back control of his medal, Reardon has demanded copper from Francisco's mines, according to Reardon. Trying to stop the order, Francisco yells at the man that he instructed him not to do it. When he returns to Reardon, he tells him, For the day when you are going to curse me and doubt everything I've ever said, the woman I love has sworn an oath to you that I am your friend. Ranardansk Jold, a pirate captured the ship three days later and sank it with the copper Reardon had demanded. To execute Taggart's commands, Reardon needs copper. Without it, Taggart cannot restore the rail line, and the economy swiftly falls. In order to rebuild the main line, Dagny closes her Rio Norte line and diverts Reardon metal from the Rio Norte line. For the permits he needs, Washington tells Jim he'll have to pay Wesley Mouch some money. Francisco inquires of Dagny as to how much longer she intends to squander her time with a corporation that does not value her abilities and abilities. The railroad is her life, and she will never leave it, is her response. The politicians and the looters are putting pressure on Jim, and he's not happy about it. The government representatives need certain information about Reardon before he can trade it to them and seize control of him. During dinner, he invites Lillian and she promises to help him. To Reardon's dismay, Lillian discovers that he has a mistress and wants him to quit the relationship. He claims he'd sooner see Lillian die than put an end to his relationship with Dagny now. To save the economy, a group of politicians and businessmen convene to draft a new law. Directive 10 to 289 mandates that people must stay in their current positions or face criminal penalties, and firms must stay open as long as they can. The government must also get all patents and copyright in the form of gift certificates. This year there will be no new inventions allowed, and each company must produce the same amount as in the previous year, no more, no fewer. Every citizen must spend the same amount as the year before, while prices and earnings are frozen. The State Science Institute will be the sole research facility. To ensure that all regulations are obeyed, the Bureau of Economic Planning has established a unification board, whose decisions are final. Even though they are aware that Reardon is going to struggle to keep his patent, Jim claims he has a way to control him and wants Mouch to raise his freight prices in exchange before the freeze begins. When Dagny learns of the new policy, she decides to leave her work as well. She makes her way out to the country to her lodge. 
the wet nurse, who is intended to keep Reardon in check, has changed his mind about it. Air Arden's criminal acts go unreported by him. Unless he signs over his patent, Dr. Ferris will divulge Reardon's relationship with Dagny. He warns him that if he doesn't turn over his invention, Lillian would damage Dagny's reputation. To safeguard Dagny, Reardon hands over the divorce papers he had been working on for years to his ex-wife, Lillian. To secure a divorce from his wife, Reardon tells his lawyers to get him out of the marriage and not give her anything. Reardon meets a stranger one night and he gives him a gold bar in return. He claims it's compensation for all the taxes he's paid to a corrupt government over the years. Ragnar Danskjold is the man's name. Despite his dislike for him, Reardon lies to the police to save his life. When Taggart's new super train, Comet, carries a prominent politician, trouble ensues. Neither the diesel engine nor the coal burner can be repaired. But a boost engineer agrees to transport the coal burner down Taggart's tunnel, and they die of asphyxiation. There was an explosion and the tunnel collapsed when a military ammunition train collided with Comet. Francisco has gone to Dagny and declares his love for her, but before he departed, the country's industrialists destroyed his copper mine, leaving nothing for the looters to steal from him and the rest of the country. In order for him to have her, he has to convince her. When she hears about the tunnel accident, she decides to go with him, despite her resentment toward him for deliberately destroying his business. To her surprise, she finds herself rushing to the aid of someone in need. A few minutes after getting things going, she tells him the looters are using her passion for railroads and his passion for metal to manipulate him. In order to encourage Dagny to give up her work and join him, Francisco tries to persuade her. Upon learning that Jane is dating Reardon, he and Eddie are both startled. Eddie is also smitten with her, as we discover. Quentin, who says he won't continue working on the motor because he doesn't want the looters to get it, suddenly leaves when he tells his lunch friend that she's going to visit him. Dagny bumps across a hobo as she crosses the country on the comet. Reardon and she found the motor at 20th Century Motor Company, which he used to work for before he retired. He relates the tale of how the business went bankrupt to her. Some employees received promotions while others faced punishments for their hard work, such as being made to work longer hours. They figured out how to play the system. It was stated that John Galt was the first individual to walk away from the company. He vowed to halt the foolishness of the businesses and put an end to the automobile industry. As a result, when the factories began to close, everyone blamed him. John Galt's name was mentioned in this context. Due to a lack of staff, the train has come to an abrupt halt and cannot continue. Quentin's whereabouts are in Dagny's sights as she boards an aircraft. When she arrives, she discovers that he has already boarded another flight. Angry that he's been kidnapped by the destroyer, she follows him into the Colorado Rockies in a plane that crashes. Part 3, A is A. Regaining consciousness, Dagny stares into the eyes of John Galt for the first time since the accident. In addition to being a pilot and the developer of the plane's power plant, he was also a friend of hers. Her location is revealed to be an isolated valley in the state of Colorado, owned by a banker. All of the city's elite, including Mayor Francisco Serrano, are present. This is the location where they've all vanished. Galt's motor has been used to build a metropolis with a variety of companies. To protect the valley, they use a unique gray screen. I swear by my life and my love of it that I will never live for the sake of another man, nor expect a man to live for mine, the oath states. You can't stay in the valley until you make the pledge and mean it. A mental strike, Galt informs Dagny, has broken out among them. On one weekend in June, everyone in the community gathers, but otherwise, some members are out and about. In order to make up her mind, Dagny offers to stay for a month. Galt employs her as a maid in order to earn a living. When Owen Kellogg shows up, he informs Dagny that the rest of the world believes she has died. She can't tell Reardon she is still alive because no one is allowed to communicate with the outside world. Soon after, Dagny knows she and Galt have fallen in love. He's been keeping an eye on her for a long time. Even if Dagny is content in the valley, she must return to her railroad to fight for it. Galt will accompany her so that he can keep an eye on her and anticipate her arrival. In exchange for their trust, she's made to wear a blindfold. Project X has been disclosed at long last. It's a weapon that uses sound waves to kill everything in its path. The population is getting increasingly difficult to manage, according to Dr. Ferris. It's an instrument of peace, according to Mouch. It is revealed that the Railroad Unification Bill has been signed into law. Among the railroads, the one with the most track is expected to reap the greatest part of the earnings. 
This makes Staggert's Railroad the most profitable because he owns the most track. As a favor to powerful allies, trains are redirected. A radio interview with Jim and Dagny reveals that she did not abandon the railroad. Dagny first refuses, but when Lillian threatens to reveal her affair with Reardon if she doesn't do the report, she relents. As a result of her outburst, the world learns of her relationship with Reardon. He returns to her later and confesses his feelings for her, but he already knows she's seeing someone else because she referred to their relationship in the past tense when they were talking about it. She confesses her love for John Galt, and he wonders where she's been all these time. Danconia Copper is to be nationalized in Argentina, so Taggart shifts his investments around and expects to make even more money. Because she has learned that he is a horrible person, his young wife refuses to rejoice with him. She departs and seeks the assistance of Dagny. Her husband, Reardon, is divorcing her, so Lillian wants Jim to intervene on her behalf. She has emotionless sex with him when he tells her he can't. When Jim's wife learns of his infidelity, he refuses to get rid of her, and as a result, they are stuck together. To him, she was worthless and would love him, but to her, his marriage was an attempt to ruin the hope she had of getting herself out of the ghetto. After he slaps her, she runs into a social worker who accuses her of being selfish for her troubles. She plunges to her death from a bridge after jumping out of it. The country is on the verge of disintegrating. A wheat crop in Minnesota is allowed to waste because the wealthy and powerful divert trains for their own benefit, while people in poorer areas suffer hungry. Copper mines are destroyed, and farming firms fail, thus output is halted. Dagny comes face to face with Galt while attempting to solve yet another train-related issue. He warns her not to go looking for her because doing so could result in his death. Every day, the government tightens its grip on Reardon's enterprise. He has been accused of filing bogus taxes. Unlike other industrialists, his family tells him he can't go away like that because he doesn't have money. At this point, he begins to see why his business has been struggling. Reardon has come to terms with Taggart, Mouch, and Boyle's strategy of keeping him on the payroll while they make money off of him. They anticipate him to continue working because he enjoys and excels at his employment. At Reardon's mill, a disturbance has broken out. Francisco, who has been working at the site since he destroyed Darconia Copper, saves Reardon from attack. It is because the wet nurse refuses to aid the rioters that Reardon is killed. Reardon has vanished. Steel production is nearly at a standstill. Fear grips the land and gang warfare erupts. Society is disintegrating, despite what the media portrays. As a means of calming the public, newspapers issue statements. Galt interrupts the head of state's broadcast to address the problem. To the American people, he explains the strike of the mind and how the government has had an effect on the country's current predicament. It's no secret that Galt has a lot to say about the virtues of morality and the pursuit of justice. Morals and ideals galore to strengthen our nation and the human race. Reclaiming the concept of objective reality is something that he encourages people to do instead of avoiding. Following the broadcast, the hunt for Galt became even more intense. Because of her worries, Dagny runs to him. In order to avoid being exploited as a tool by him, she is told she must act as though he is her enemy. Attempts to persuade Galt to join them in a dictatorship are unsuccessful. They force him to do things under duress, but he refuses to do them in his mind. According to the media, he's working for the government, but he is not. On television, he raises the gun to his head and points it towards the camera. As the state of California descends into civil conflict, the comet becomes immobile. Francisco asks Dagny if Galt is in danger and asks her to tell him. It's clear to Dr. Stadler that he can't get Galt on board with him, and the only way he can save his position is to take over Project X. An additional crook is already on the loose, Cuffy Megs. Once it's been fought over and set off, the carnage may be felt for miles around. Washington's decision makers are at their wit's end. Dr. Ferris has an idea for how to punish Galt, torture. Dagny finally phones Francisco after hearing about this. The Taggart Bridge was demolished by the blast as she was leaving to meet him. The first time she puts love before career, she says yes. In a conversation with Francisco, she informs him that she is prepared to go on strike and swear an oath. Electrodes are used to inflict pain on Galt. When Galt tells Dr. Ferris about his hidden plans to rule the world as an economic dictator, he intends to continue torturing him. A malfunctioning equipment causes the operator to realize that he is responsible for it, and he runs out of the room. When Jim realizes he is a terrorist, he yells and falls to the ground, determined to stop Galt at all costs. In order to save Galt, 
Dagny and Reardon rescued Francisco and Danisk Jold. Then they flee to Colorado in Francisco's jet. The comet, meanwhile, has broken down in the desert. Eddie refuses to leave the train, even when the passengers are saved by a convoy of covered wagons. After the collapse of the economy, the Valley's industrialists are ready to return to the outside world and begin the process of rebuilding. They want to start over with a new set of ethical standards. Characters Early Feminist Dagny Taggart Dagny is Taggart Transcontinental's vice president and the sister of the company's owner. She has worked hard to earn her place in the organization and is its linchpin. Despite the fact that her brother is dishonest and cunning, she maintains a strong work ethic. The problem is that she prioritizes work above all else. Dagny is the first person everyone turns to when there is an issue at work. She has a good reputation for being dependable and fair with her staff. A blow to feminists, but indicative of the time era the book was written in. She never stands up for herself when her brother takes advantage of her efforts. Her affair with a married man goes unpunished, and then she falls in love with Galt, who is married. She, on the other hand, does not allow her romantic connections to control her life decisions. He's a steel baron and a genius, all rolled into one. Hank creates a new type of steel that is superior in quality to what is already available. He and Dagny spend a lot of time brainstorming new ideas for using industry to make the world a better place. Hank's marriage is tumultuous, and his family treats him poorly at home. When the government decides to mistreat him, he accepts it for a longer period of time than most people would. As a result, the workers he employs have an admiration and respect for him because of his high standards of work ethic and morality. His affair with Dagny makes him feel guilty, but he recognizes that he is deserving of her love. Galt understands that she chooses to love him and leaves his failing business to join the strike when she does so. John Galt a long time ago, worked in a plant that produced automobile engines. The firm where he worked mismanaged his groundbreaking new motor, so he never got the chance to introduce it to the world. John is a brilliant thinker who saw the obvious conclusion to his observations of the world around him, and so he went on a mental rampage. In a revolution that began with his simple dismissal from the workforce, he led a group of like-minded individuals. Many in his group were fed up with the government's intrusion into their life and wanted to be free to do what they wanted to do creatively. When Galt goes undercover at Taggart Transcontinental, he falls in love with Dagny, but he keeps it a secret from the company. In secret, he and she have been working together for a decade. As soon as she's allowed to see him, she, too, falls head over heels in love with him. The first love of Dagny's was Francisco Danconia. When he realized what the looters were doing to his business, they were already in a relationship. Only by deliberately causing his business to collapse could he hope to protect it from their grasp. To begin his new career as a reckless playboy, he had to break up with the love of his life. The copper mines he owned had been run the same way the factory where John Galt worked was run after he wasted his wealth there. He quickly rose to the position of becoming Galt's most effective revolutionary recruiter. James Daggart he is the president of Taggart Transcontinental and Dagny's older brother. He is a manipulator who wants to sabotage anything that is useful. Jim makes his money through the efforts of others. He takes credit for his sister's triumphs and transfers the blame on her for his mistakes. He emotionally abuses his wife to the point where she commits suicide. When she was just a few years old, Ayn Rand moved to the United States from Russia, where she had been educated, and settled in New York City. When he was just nine years old, Rand was already penning screenplays. She grew up with a successful pharmacist and businessman father. Pharmacy and building were owned by him. Olga Nabokov, Vladimir Nabokov's younger sister, attended Rand's school. The two daughters used to have political debates with Rand when they were younger, with the Republican side always winning. After the October Revolution, Rand's family's lives were forever altered. His company had been ruined, and they were now without a home. The family was forced to flee to Crimea. While residing in Crimea, she graduated from high school at the age of 16. They returned to Russia following the end of the Russian Civil War. In Russia, Rand was one of the first women to attend college. At Petrograd State University, she majored in social pedagogy and philosophical studies. Plato and Aristotle's writings were introduced to her while she was in the university. Nietzsche was also a favorite of hers. Due to her ability to read in a variety of languages, French, German, and Russian, Rand was exposed to the works of many other notable authors, including Hugo and Rostan. Rand was expelled from college shortly before graduation along with a group of bourgeois classmates, 
but was later reinstated and permitted to graduate as a result of objections from visiting foreign scientists. Rand attended the State Technicum for Screen Arts in Leningrad after graduating from college in 1924 with a degree in history. An essay on a Russian actress she wrote during her time in Russia was her first published work, and she discovered her nomenclature to write with. Rand may be a reference to her birth name, Rosenbaum, and her first name, Ain, which means I in Hebrew. Rand visited family in the United States in 1925 and fell in love with it. She aspired to be a screenwriter and was fortunate enough to have relatives in the Windy City who helped her get her foot in the door. Cecil B. The Mill discovered her while she was working as a waitress in Hollywood. He hired her to work as an extra in his picture The King of Kings, which he produced. Frank O'Connor, a promising young actor, was her husband at the time. In 1929, they exchanged vows. In 1931, Rand became a citizen of the United States. Her mother and sisters were unable to join her in the United States due to a lack of immigration papers. Her first script deal was with Universal Studios in 1932. Red Pawn, a spy thriller, was the film's screenplay. The Fountainhead, a dystopian novel, was her first major breakthrough as a novelist. Atlas Shrugged was the next major work by Rand. A moral philosophy novel. It is Paust Rand's objectivist ideology. Reality exists independent of awareness, and people can utilize reasoning and morality to obtain happiness through this belief. The goal is to focus on things outside of oneself rather than on one's own feelings. As a result, she was certain that reasoning was the greatest method to learn. Since Rand's death, there has been an uptick in interest in her work. The Ayn Rand Society was established in 1987 as a forum for debating Rand's theories. Many colleges and universities throughout the world still use her work. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this. See you in next video.